more. Yeah. Whoops. Whoops. Got an infinity window there, buddy. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. It's recording. Um, we're talking about the seven mountains, and these seven mountains are are basically the seven seven major areas of influence within a nation that determines which way that nation is going to move, whether towards God or towards uh, in, a, in a different direction from that. And uh, so we, we talked, uh, we showed a, a video last week uh, about the beginning of that, and how it all got started. And back in uh, the 1950s, so this, this concept's been going on since the 50s, 30, 30 some years, 40 some years, longer than that. Um, the guy who founded Youth with a Mission, uh, Charles somebody Cunningham, and then the guy that was involved with uh, something else, I can't remember, but it will show up. And they, they got together. Well, actually, what happened is the Lord gave both of them a vision at the same time about the same thing and told them that they were supposed to go talk to the other person. And uh, so whenever they did, they found out that what God was saying was uh, in talking about how to reclaim the nation for God because we really got off on the wrong track and gave them what later turned out to be a concept, a strategy called the Seven Mountains. Now I'm going to start out by showing you a, a, a well, let me go a different direction here. I'm going to start out by doing what? Uh, I'm going to go over here. This guy's name was, was Lance Wallnow. He is one of the major speakers for this movement. He's a, quite a guy. He's a Jewish background, and uh, he was a pastor at one time. But anyway, uh, without looking at what's on the screen there, who can tell me what the seven mountains are? <laughs> Media. 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 Arts and entertainment. Government. 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 Media. Business. Economy. Religion. Did you name government? Yeah, religion. Yeah, good one. Uh, religion, religion, government, education. Yeah, education. And uh, arts and entertainment and so forth. So anyway, and family. Yeah. Family, yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got family. Now, the, one of the ways that uh, this guy, has anybody heard of, of Kim Clement? A group like this, somebody's heard of Kim Clement. Anyway, he was a major prophet. Right. And the... Uh, in Christendom, particularly among mm -hmm. the Charismatics and those that believe in prophecy, and uh, a major voice. And uh, this this story is told by his secretary. He's now dead. And she was talking to Lance Walnoff, who was telling him about that. You see that a, a man dropped dead for 40 minutes before he was resuscitated and had a vision of Eden in which God calls him to government. In the vision, the man sees a great ocean, in the ocean seven islands and which grow in the mountains. Behind these mountains emerges an even larger mountain, which God says was his mountain. The mountains of culture, and behind it was my kingdom, which is greater than all the kingdoms of the world. The, point, the Lord points out to one of the mountains and says, Michael, this is the devil's mountain, and you are to go into it, to this guy who had his vision. And meanwhile, the man's wife began to pray over him, and he came back to life. Lance well, heard about this message through this guy's secretary. He called the secretary and went and talked to her in particular about it, and she didn't even remember the details of the conversation. And Lance feels as though the angel was talking to him about the details about the seven mountains. The seven mountains are seven spheres of influence or mind influencers, mind molders of culture and which mold the way a nation moves and, and, and what the interests are. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about here a little later is that uh, 
the, the, the leaders of a nation are not necessarily the ones that are actually determining the way things go. Instead, it's those people that are influencing them. And uh, so the idea behind taking the seven mountains for God is that we as Christians need to be involved in these seven areas. In government, religion, arts and entertainment, media, of course, we're all involved in the family, government, and so forth. And as we're involved in those areas, and, and we are people of influence, and if we can get to the point where we have influence with, with people that are in power, then we can influence them. And uh, later, later on, I'm going to show you a, uh, an example of that in the Old Testament. He also talks about sheep and goat nations. Uh, the sheep nations being those nations that are not in direct opposition to the word or to the gospel, to the spread of the gospel, to Christendom and so forth, whereas goat nations are those that are directly opposed to Christianity and so forth. And so Christianity is the greatest system for securing domestic tranquility and uh, any nation that has a Christian worldview, worldview has prospered disproportionately to those that don't. And uh, there's some reason for that there. And every nation is either a sheep or a goat nation. Um, and he talks about here, he's quoting Matthew 25, that uh, when the Lord comes back, he's going to separate the, sh the sheep nations from the goat nations and so forth. He also talked to Abraham blessing and told him that the Lord wants to make him the head and not the tail. And uh, he'll be above and not beneath. beneath. The question comes up, why is being on top important? Why is the head important? And because the head directs the body. 90% of the nation is determined by the 5% that occupy the gates of influence as the mind molders of culture. Now think about that. We have a president now. Whether he's a Christian or not a Christian, I'm not going to, to argue that point. Personally, I think that he is. And Lance says that he knows that he is because he feels that he was involved in his conversion. But at any point, he has decided and he has gathered around himself a whole bunch of Christian leaders from the nation. They say that there's 120 Christian leaders that he calls upon and brings together with him for them to pray over him, pray over his counsel, and pray over major decisions that he gets involved in. So that's what we want to do is we want to be able to move into using, you know, every one of us has a sphere of influence. Uh, anybody been, ever been involved in direct, I mean, uh, multi-level marketing or network marketing? Mm -hmm. A couple of you have. Uh, but anyway, the basic idea behind it, if you're involved in that and you're trying to, to move, the idea is that you have a sphere of influence. <clears throat> if I'm trying to expand my network, if you will, then I want to approach you and I want to get Bob involved because he has a sphere and if I can get into his sphere by getting him involved in my program, then I can expand my business and so forth. So the same idea applies to this. We all have a sphere of influence, and we want to, to use our sphere of influence to influence people for God. And if we can, there's a, uh, I have a thing I'll show you sometime later, not part of this lesson. There is, uh, in the scriptures, uh, Jesus talks to me, he's sending these guys out, uh, the 70, where he sent oh, them out. Two by two. He sent them out, and he told them that when they came into a city, that he was, that they were to go to a house and they were to stay there. If they were re received by whomever the house they went to. The, well, that whole thing has been uh, turned into a, principle for discipleship and, uh, and uh, winning new converts and so forth called finding the person of peace. 
And basically what you do, you go into an area and you find somebody who will accept you and invite you into their sphere. And that opens up the sphere. And he's the person of peace that is going to recommend you to his sphere of influence and sort of help you get things established. So that person of peace, if we are involved in trying to move into these seven mountains, one of the things that we want to do uh, you take me, for example, I was involved in, in government for a long time with, with the military, uh, Department of Defense, and Bob was also. Prior to that, I was involved in, in private industry. I worked with NASA for a while. And uh, so in that, in that area, I had a sphere of influence. And uh, so I could get involved with people and invite them Later, when I became a government employee, it was a little more difficult <laughs> because there are certain constraints in, uh, as a government employee. But I remember my boss, whenever I was working with NASA out in, in, uh, in Houston at the Mission Control Center, I was working for a computer company called Univac. My boss was, uh, was a Mormon, and he used his sphere of influence and to try to, to get people interested in the Mormon religion. And he was constantly inviting people to these little meetings. And uh, a, a large number of the uh, uh, astronauts were Mormon. I didn't realize that, but anyway, I got invited, Lydia and I got invited to a meeting and uh, at which this Mormon, um, this astronaut was going to be speaking. I was interested in hearing the astronaut speak. So we went there and after we had our luncheon or whatever it was, I don't remember exactly. This guy gets up to speak and he starts talking about how Mormonism got started. He started talking about how when, when Jesus left the earth and went up, that he didn't really go up to heaven. Instead, he came to the Americas. And when he came to the Americas, um, the, the Indians and so forth, they recognized him as being some divine divinity, and there are a lot of caves, and he showed pictures of all these caves with these drawings in these caves of a uh, fair-skinned person with a halo around his head that all these natives and so forth were worshiping. And, you know, it caused you to think, but the point that I'm trying to make here is he was talking about this was a sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And because this person was in that sphere, he could invite others in and influence them for whatever purpose he wanted to. Uh, and then we also see that one of the purposes of being a head and not was to be able to bless all nations. That was one of the reasons that the Lord gave Abraham favor and told him he was going to be the head and not the tail was because that would put him in a position to bless all nations. Now, we see in, in Luke 4 where the devil takes uh, Jesus up to the top of the mountain and uh, says, jump off of this place and all that kind of stuff. The Lord's going to help you. And he says, but I will. He showed him the earth in a moment of time mm -hmm. and told him, I will give all this authority to you if you kneel down and die. Your Jews didn't do that as we know. But. The question comes up is, who would say Satan give the nations of the world to? And if you look into it, Satan gives the nations of the world to the kings of the world. You know, mm -hmm. says that there are principalities, mm -hmm. and so princes and principalities in, of the air and so forth. The devil, the Satan is giving the world and authority to rule the earth to his minions mm -hmm. who will follow him and so forth. And these guys are the kings of the world. These kings are decision makers and influence shapers. He gives that Satan to those, those that authority to those who are antagonistic to Christ. These people are anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. And nations that function in that way are these goat nations that we're talking about. God puts those in authority, and man is so dysfunctional that without common grace, we would all be destroyed because we're so dysfunctional. Some of the greatest political leaders, kings, were not overt Christians. 
such as Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, etc. Influence shaping and decision making are done by the people in power, but oftentimes the people influence those are more strategic than the strategic maker. Anybody remember Ahithophel? Remember when David was kicked out of Jerusalem by his son Absalom? Uh -huh. And Absalom's goal was to kill David mm -hmm. and take over the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And David had a, an advisor that had been with him for years and was truly anointed of the Lord. He was sort of a seer, and he, he was really anointed of the Lord. Well, for some reason, he got to the point where he despised David. And when Absalom came along, Ahithophel went and joined his self to Absalom. And when the word of that came back to, to David, David had a, 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 a friend named Hushai. Is that the right spelling of it? Hushai. Yeah. Hushai. Yeah. And Hushai, he, David told Hushai to go to Absalom and to undermine whatever Ahithophel said. So they went he went there, and Ahithophel told uh, Absalom, the best thing you can do is attack David immediately, where he is right now, before he can get organized. Well, Hushai stepped in and says, that is excellent advice. You should do exactly that, but the timing is wrong. You should not do it right now. You need to wait a while to do it. Well, Absalom took Hushai's advice instead of Ahithophel's. And Ahithophel felt as though, uh-oh, this is the end of Absalom, because he doesn't follow my advice. My advice was from the wisdom of the Lord. And so Ahithophel went back to his uh, hometown and uh, hung himself. Well, it turns out that Hushai's advice was right, and David was able to, to rout Absalom, get the kingdom back, and so forth. But the point that I'm trying to make with this story here is who had the most influence over what was going on. It wasn't the decision maker, Absalom. It was his influencers. And he listened to those influencers, Ahithophel right. and Hushai. So the whole idea behind this thing is that we, as Christians, need to move in whatever sphere of influence that we have so that we can become influencers with to the decision makers. Mm -hmm. Now, if you sit back and look at and say, what is, the, um, what is the sphere of influence that I am in that I could possibly have an influence in? A lot of us are retired, so we could ask that question, it says, but you, you take Becky here, and she's a school teacher, was a school teacher. So she had influence in the school system. She had influence in her class. There were uh, students in her class that she had, could have influence with. She could have had influence with the uh, parents of those students and so forth. Uh, she could have influence with the, within the school itself to the principal and so forth, even with the uh, superintendent of schools and so forth. Uh, Bob was in the government, uh, and I was in the government. We had certain influence that we could exert. Of course, when you're working for the government, you got to be careful about how you do that. Uh, but, and then uh, you, uh, other people can have, uh, have had influence in whatever sphere that you're in. And so the idea is, did we know that we had influence? Did the idea ever occur to us that we should use our influence for the Lord? And the answer to that is probably it didn't. And so the whole concept between the, the, uh, the, the seven mountain strategy, before we get to the end, we're going to see a strategy presented as to how we can get into these mountains and win the mountain back for God. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let me go a little bit further. Um, 
He gives some examples of Joseph, Daniel, and Esther being lead, uh, all influenced the leaders of the nation. Um, for example, Joseph and Pharaoh. Pharaoh ruled the nation and so forth. But when you come right down to it, Joseph was the guy that saved the nation. He saved the he saved the Jews and, and, and so forth because of the influence that he was in. Okay. Now here's a very interesting thing. Leg, lesbian, gay, I don't know what the B is, transgender agenda. Bus, yeah, bus. Oh, yeah. Okay. has been per perpetuated through the mountains of media entertainment and education. Mm -hmm. Even though so few Americans are actually of that persuasion, through the campaigns of media and education alongside the other mountains such as business and politics, whom gets on board to the full of the world? This nation has been shaped. Mm -hmm. Our laws have been changed. Mm -hmm. Our decisions within the Supreme Court, the court decisions have all been influenced by 5% or less of the people. And how did they do it? By gaining, in, using their influence to gain uh, some kind of control within the media, arts, and entertainment. Because the arts and entertainment, we uh, listen to them more than we do the preacher on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We listen to them more than we read our Bible. We listen to them more than uh, we do God. In our in our uh, daily devotion, we might spend 15 minutes, we might spend a half hour, we might spend an hour, we might spend two hours. But how many hours are spent each day looking at news, movies, etc. So now I want to talk another a little bit about oh this is an issue even though the LGBT rights were emphasized among American women women a whopping 95% say that infidelity is completely unacceptable in marriage. But if you watch movies yeah, they're all you listen to the news yeah I mean, if, if, if you watch just about any program, mm -hmm. you can always see some kind of sexual innuendo in there. Absolutely. And you can always see some something where the, the heroine of the movie is a single woman with a child. Yeah. She's divorced or whatever, never been married, whatever the situation is. In other words, the family is, is demeaned. In, in this situation, and it's, it's come down to the point to where we've accepted it mm -hmm. as the norm. It used to be that within the church, the Christian church, that uh, the vast majority of Christians were uh, the divorce rate within among Christians was less than it was by non Christians. Mm -hmm. Today, it's about the same. Whether you're Christian or, or non-Christian, the divorce rate is, a, is about the same um, because it's so accepted. I want to talk a little bit about micro churches. I talked about this a little bit last week. Now, I realize I'm talking more in this review because I've got some other things to say. A micro church. What would you say a micro church is? A small a church. Huh? Small church. A mini church. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a difference between micro, uh, uh, macro or major. I'm going to show you something over here. We've seen the mega church, uh -huh. but how about the um, a micro church? See that picture there? Mm -hmm. That church is a micro church. They call it a dinner church. A it's a, a dinner, dinner church. A dinner church. Yeah. What it is is it's a, a cell group for, for us. Uh, it's like our cell like group. Yeah. You yeah. just took my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 
my question after I go in and explaining all this is what is do any of us know or are we familiar with any micro churches? Uh -huh. We're a micro church. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's the point I was trying to make. Now, even though we're a micro church, a lot of times we don't get outside that door. You're right. In other words, we come together mm -hmm. to study the Bible, mm -hmm. to learn from each other, to have fellowship and so forth. But what we're missing is a direction from the Holy Spirit as to how we are supposed to influence the seven mountains. Because each of us has a sphere of influence that we can move in. Now, this micro church here is, is called a, a dinner church. And what they do is they meet in a storefront in Brooklyn. And they've got about 30 people. Everybody's welcome. When you walk in there and they start, they start preparing the meal. Anybody that walks in that wants to participate, they can chop vegetables, they can help prepare things, they can spread the table, they can set the tables and, and, and yeah. co communicate with each other and so forth. And when it's all over, they help with the cleanup and so forth. And what they try to do is go and invite people to come have dinner with us and come to this church. Now, this church has been relatively successful in that this dinner church now consists of about three different dinner churches mm -hmm. of about 20 to 30 people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the philosophy that we had when we started small groups. We would start a small group, and when that small group got up to 12 to 15 people, we wanted to yeah. do what? Split. Split. Multiply. Well, multiply instead of split. Yeah. <laughs> we, they may want to multiply so that they, those two small groups can then grow and multiply again. Mm -hmm. Well, I got news for you, folks. This group right here has been in business for 44 years. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> but we, and we've had other groups that have formed out of this group, so I don't yes. even say that we haven't uh, mm -hmm. followed some of that philosophy there. All right, uh, let me go back over here to where I was, if I can find it. <laughs> so, if you want to know more about microgroups and so forth, right there, mm -hmm. right there is a link. If you want to write that down, it's not on that paper okay. we're looking at. This paper is not the one you've got there. Okay. I was going to print this out for you and give it to you. But it's a PDF, and I can't get it to print on two pieces of paper. I mean, front and back. Yeah. So it's seven pages, and I didn't want oh, to print out seven times 14 pages. Mm -hmm. So instead, mm -hmm. tonight, before we leave, if everybody will give me your email address mm -hmm. and your phone number, of course, the name to go with it, and say that you want it, mm -hmm. I will send these to you via a link okay and you can uh look at them on your computer rather than me printing out all that paper sounds good mm -hmm. and, you got uh, mine. because i've talked to bob yeah. you know and big and so forth and he has refused to pay for my paper bill well the church would but you guys can read on your computer yeah, right. all right now, that's what the technology this thing here insinuates that where was the first uh, micro church? Among the believers. Mm -hmm. What's in Acts? What did you say? Among the, the first talk up, talk up. Among the first century Christians. <coughs> yeah, it might have been Adam and Eve. Uh, well, That's yeah. why you say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were the first. Huh. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's about that. And my question <laughs> down here: the most prevalent micro <laughs> church in, in Christendom yeah. today is what? And Pat stole my phone. I mean, Pam stole my phone. <laughs> yeah. It's a small group. Now, let's talk about that small group. In China, mm -hmm. there are millions of Christians in China that are all on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they're in small micro churches. As a matter of fact, we know of one, um, Buford met her in Israel, one little Chinese woman. Mm -hmm that she is the pastor over 5,000 oh Chinese people wow. that all meet in these little small uh, groups. Awesome. 
And uh, so that, that church is going. Awesome. All right. Um, let me go a little further. He says, what is needed to disciple a nation is a sustained pattern of public persuasion. Mm -hmm. Now, is that not what has happened with the gay movement mm -hmm. yeah. and the LGBTs and so mm -hmm. forth? Is that not what has happened with the, what's that word I'm looking for, the degradation of Christianity in the eyes of the American public. Mm -hmm. It was uh, 50 or so hundred years ago that uh, Christians and Christian mor morals and standards and so forth were held in high esteem. But today, anything that has to do with Christianity is questioned. Mm -hmm. And I want to throw it out. This guy suggests that we need believers who are preaching the word overtly. I mean, they're actively out there preaching the word, mm -hmm. such as the Dirk Woods of this oh, world. Yes. Oh, <laughs> boy. Yeah. And then if you don't know who that is, he's one of our missionaries. He's, oh, he's, very he's, a, he's a street preacher. He's a very, very successful. He's got, uh, he started churches in the Philippines and London, and he's now in South Africa. Uh, organization called uh, Arise and Sign, which he uh, founded, and his primary way of getting converts is preaching to gangsters, mm -hmm. the, the downer and outers mm -hmm. on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. He gets converts, he get, uh, and he gets invited into mm -hmm. these gangs, mm -hmm. and they protect him. They sure do. They he, they're in that with him. It, I've been there and done that with it in London and in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he can go just about any way he goes, mm -hmm. and you can find gangsters and mobsters mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, but they protect him. Yes. And it's just quite a thing. But it's definitely a God a God thing going on there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, I want to show you something very interesting. Before I get into this shadow group, shadow party, I want to show you something else. Does anybody know who, does the name Rothschild mean anything? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, how many of you know what who, who, the, the name Rothschild? No. Cook to bacon, baking, money. Okay. How, how about uh, Rockefeller? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. That Oil. name means a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I want to show you something over here. Let me go back over to this side of the fence. And um, we're going to talk about re what in the world is this garbage? <laughs> that's your seven mountains. That's right. That, that uh -huh. depicts the seven mountains. Like that wasn't where I was supposed to be. I know. I've had another picture up there before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bob would say, "It's you pointed to the wrong thing. You, yes, it's your right. fault, not the oh, yeah, computer. <laughs> computer only does what you tell it." Oh, oh, we're so talking about the importance of key influencers in the world. Now, one of the things I didn't mention yet, but I mentioned last week, is of the seven mountains, which of those seven mountains has more the most control? and influence over which way a nation goes. The finances, business. Business. Finance. Because the business support mm -hmm. all the others. Mm -hmm. They have to have money to be able to survive, to be able to get their agenda across and so forth. So the business mountain is the one that has the most influence. I want to show you a, a few things here. Some tipping points in culture where not culture tips for Christ or tips for evil. That guy right there, his name is Nathan Mayer Rothschild. And he says, I don't care what per puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire on which the sun never sets. 
the man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, mm -hmm. and I control the British money supply. Mm -hmm. He is also one of the founders of Illuminati. Uh, What's it again? Illuminati. The Illuminati. We'll talk about that. Oh, yeah. Anybody I ever heard of the Illuminati? Yes. Yeah. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. That's uh, him. This guy right here is Henrik Payne. He said, Money is the god of our time, and Rothschild is his prophet. Mm -hmm. This guy here, his name is Jacob Rothschild. He said, My family is worth. Five hundred trillion dollars. They control most of the banks in the world. We own nearly every central bank in the world. We finance both sides of every war since Napoleon. We own your news, the media, your oil, and your government. And you've probably never even heard of me. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, isn't Rothschilds? The name, the origin, Jewish? Yes. You picked that up. Yeah. Okay, it is Jewish. And this is one of the reasons why the Jews throughout the world have been condemned so much mm -hmm. because the money is from the Rothschilds and so forth and the evil of that that's done with that money has been associated with the Jews and that's why they have been persecuted so much. Ah. Didn't know that till I studied this. But anyway, yeah. this guy right here, David Rockefeller, mm -hmm. he says, some even believe that we are part of a secret cabal uh -huh. working against the best interest of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. Huh. Yeah. This guy, you recognize him? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, this is a famous statement of his. Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the energy can control whole continents. But who controls money controls the world. Hmm. Anybody heard of the Talmud? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's the book of the scribes and the Pharisees. In 1770, Mayor Anshel Rothschild wow. drew up plans for the creation of the Illuminati and entrusted Ashkin's whatever Ashkenazi. Jew, yeah. Adam Wesner, yeah. a crypto Jew who was outwardly Roman Catholic, but inwardly wasn't with its organization and development. Hmm. The Illuminati is to be based upon the teachings of the Talmud, which in turn is the teachings of rabbinical Jews. It was to be called the Illuminati as this is the Luciferian term, which means keepers of the light. Now most people, if you mention the Illuminati, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If you talk about what the purpose of it is, they'll laugh in your eyes and in your face because they don't believe this, what we're talking about. Secret society. Just don't believe that our society is actually being controlled outside of our of what we know. Mm -hmm. But there's a possibility that it may be. Mm -hmm. This guy right here is James Abram Garfield. Mm -hmm. He made the same statement. Almost. Whoever controls the volume of money in any country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. And when you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled one way or another by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression within a nation originate. Yeah. And go on. Recognize that guy? George Soros has been discipling our nation for years. Now this guy is a he's Greek and he is a Hungarian. He's probably Greek. It sounds Greek. Soros. He has anti-God values, anti-family agendas, 
more government control, refraining language, progressive movement, any Christian messaging, funding hundreds of liberal organizations. Hmm. And one of the things we might be aware of is looking back in what has happened with the uh, election which put, put Trump in, was that he was financing all most of these uh, riots in these cities and so forth. Oh, yeah. It was his money, but they were paying people to go to these cities yeah. and riot. And they were paying them like fifteen dollars an hour plus on the board and all that kind of stuff. Doing yeah. free cell phones and all that other. These guys with money on the wrong side are influencing the direction in which this nation goes. Now, I want to show you this is the money puppeteer controls America. I'm going to go show you something about that. Take it a while to spin. Hello, everybody. Great. You did it. Live here on Facebook. <laughs> we caught Pension uh, coming in online and on the radio about this little crisis, which could be a big crisis, in my opinion, in Ada, Oklahoma, the hometown headquarters of the Gospel Station Network. Uh, here's what's going on they're about to cut that crop. Right. They're about to bring a crane in and literally cut it off. And uh, we're, we're not real happy about this. This is on the campus of East Central University. This is a chapel. It was donated for the purpose of prayer chapels 60 years ago. This is a 60-year-old building. And we need some attention on this. We need some people to share this. We're about to go uh, interview some folks live. In fact, coming up in just a minute, we have the head of the foundation. The central that's going to open the door and we're going to go in because not only are they going to require this cross to be held, but they're going to have to remove the Bibles out of the chapel. How absurd is this? If you're watching right now or listening, please share it. Let everybody know this is all that's happening right now. And uh, we really need to get this out far and wide, all of the United States. Please don't stand back and do nothing. Join with us to take action. To this is the Boswell Chapel. My name is Randall Christie on the Gospel Station Network. Now I'm going to walk over here and show you the uh, plaque on the front of this beautiful historic building. It was uh, donated by the Boswell in 1957, and this plaque was placed on the wall to commemorate that contribution. And it all will be okay. You get the idea. Basically, what's going on here is the, I can't remember the name of that, that group, eight, the anti-Christ Christian, uh, ALCU or something like that. ACLU. ACLU. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did that happen? They cut the cross off? Did that happen? Yeah. No. No? If you follow up on the story with what? Okay. Uh, a, 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 a support group, a Christian support group, came in and said, we will fund your fight. Now, the, the school was caving in to the demands of this organization, and they were caving in because they did not have the money to go to court. So this Christian group came in, some Christian businessmen came in and said, we will pay whatever your costs are to fight this. And so they went to court, they fought it, and they won. And so they didn't have to have that done. It's like our cross down here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they did. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Did they take it down here? Well, the last I heard, they were going to take it down here. The last I don't know what the story on that is. But the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that a group is organized, mm -hmm. and they're organized for the purpose of defeating Christianity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Christianity mm -hmm. needs to do some organization of our own. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to get that. Get your butt back in here. I want to show you something. <laughs> start working? Yes. About 
time we turn it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got one <laughs> I want to talk to you about the Thunder Road Group Shadow Party. In 2004, a group of Democrats formed an apostolic round table or nerve center in order to, buy, to devise political strategies and messages and public relations in order to shift culture within the United States. Mm they did this they devised a plan to choose seven main areas where christians and conservatives were strongest and that they were going to lay siege against those seven places where the christians were the strongest they identified previously existing liberal organizations that were able to combat each area and decided how much money support resources each one of these groups cost and this group was called the Southern Sisters. They recruited 100 of the wealthiest marketplace <laughs> leaders that they knew that had a bent towards what they were going to do and that could contribute $1 million each to the campaign. So they could apostolically control all the organizations that were putting in place to come against their opponents <laughs> who were the Christians in order to redefine American culture. Now let me ask you a question. Have they been successful? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you can see what's going on within the US and you can see that they have been successful. The definition of reality, well, let me see, the, uh, the ultimate premise was, whoever dominates the high places of culture has the power to define the meaning of of reality. The definition of reality is controlled by those that control the cultural output. The alarming thing about the strategy is that all of these organizations were had benevolent sounding names. Who doesn't want to move on from from whatever the past is? Who doesn't want the, the vote to be true? Who doesn't want to organize for America? These are some of the names mm -hmm. that they used in their organization. It's almost like they're counterfeit ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. They're organized entities that agree together for the accomplishment of single objectives and agendas in discipling culture. The country is a, in a time of serious economic peril and the church can have a major role in helping the country. 70% of Americans' employable businesses is small business and one-third of them are family-owned Christian businesses. Now let that sink in. 70% of America's employable businesses, the people working in these businesses, is a small business and one-third of those are family-owned Christian businesses. So my question is, what if we, Christians, could form our own shadow party to go back and try to reclaim America for Christ? If these guys can go out and find a hundred people who have a million dollars to donate to their cause, why can't the Christians come together? and find a hundred people that can make the same kind of a donation. If they did, you'd be in direct opposition to George Soros, and he's got more money than you got. But my point is, we aren't even trying, except in a few cases. You take this guy who's, uh, I can't, I wish I could remember names. This, he's on CBN a, a lot, this attorney. Okay. What? J. Sexual. Yeah, J. Sexual. His organization is there and they're out fighting for the underdog Christian all the time. And they're using their own money, whatever money they can come up with and so forth. But they're needed. And this organization that came in to help this Ada church, mm -hmm. or this church in Ada, Oklahoma, they came up with money to do that. If I wish I had the energy and I wish I had the, the means to go about and start a shadow group mm -hmm. and could bring together 
the people that could do that, that could could donate that kind of money. But you do you do you know anybody that could make significant contributions to something like that? Somebody in your I know we know. Somebody in your oikos, that's the Greek word for sphere of influence. Somebody in your oikos, somebody that in the your sphere of influence knows somebody yeah. that could possibly have an influence to do that. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is find a champion that could take this on to get it done, who's not 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Age is just a number, buddy. There That's you go. True. Okay. It's 7.30. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the takeaway of this story is the promise of Abraham for the church is to bless the rest of the world to be the head, not the tail, the above, not below. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve were given dominion of the earth to subdue from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Satan influences the kingdoms of the earth, so we are to exercise a strategy to influence the heads of cultural men. Mm -hmm. We are to carry the presence of God into every sphere of the culture through micro churches. Mm -hmm. I know of several organizations which are house churches. They're organizations of house churches. I'm talking about in the U.S., not necessarily China. We are much stronger than we realize if we would only work together. That sounds like Josh's sermons, doesn't it? Hey, where do you think he got the sermon? <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. That makes me think of Nepal because... Uh, Yes. Small yes. churches all around. I know that one day Sudeep and I popped to six different little churches during the day mm -hmm. to visit with them. Mm -hmm. And I saw a move of the Holy Spirit. Little oh, I saw a move of the Holy Spirit that it, 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 and we we get through ministering there and, and, and praying with them and praying for them and, and all and Sudeep said we gotta go. I didn't want to leave because just oh but we had to go to the next one. So I think it was six churches, little, small little groups, 10, 15, maybe, maybe 20, if that I, many. I, I think Sudeep in Nepal, I think he has somewhere near the 40 churches that are associated with him there. Well, let me tell you, we, we hop each day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, whenever you were over there, you were hopping to these churches. Were they underground churches? They are... Nepal is in a deep, deep political situation right now, now where the, the government mm -hmm. is stepping in and saying any plagiar, what's that the word, plagiarizing, what is the term I'm looking for, proselyting, proselyting of people away from the Hindu religion towards any other religion is a capital crime. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you're a, an indigent, if you're from Nepal, and you're guilty of that, you can be thrown into prison. If you're a non Nepali and you're found doing this, you're exported out of the country. And we have a, a major uh, Sudip Kaka. I've seen that in country. Siberia is so persecuted, but those churches there are on fire for God. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine, Nepal, all these countries where they're persecuted, the home churches. Oh my. Mm -hmm. And they meet in areas like you would not believe. Well, the McKetchen said China has gotten that way. He, they had to leave. Who did? The McKetchens over there in China. Yeah. Well, the, the, the church in China is the fastest growing church in the world. Yeah. Uh, the underground church. <laughs> the underground church, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. we're going to have to stop because it's, yeah. our time yeah. is running out. Uh, and so I'm going to. Let me just ask this so we can get questions if, if we have any on the report. Uh, anybody got any comment they want to make? Or whatever, anybody want to say anything? Go for it. I studied this study many years ago. We were Real actually, louder. oh, <clears throat> we're the Hollies. We actually met Ken Clement many times 
He actually was ministering in Fort Walton Beach uh, more than 32 years ago when he just came out of South Africa. And a friend of mine, I had this on tape actually from him, mm -hmm. on cassette tape. And the problem that he said throughout the whole um, times we've ever met him and saw him was that the churches are so divided and the churches are made up of people. And even if you got 100 people or 10,000 people, nobody can come to the same agreement. Yeah, and that's, it doesn't matter how much money you have and all the different churches that you had, you know, and it, I see this, I thought, oh my God, I can hear him actually speaking this because he was always here in Pensacola, Brownsville, and he was also in Fort Walton Beach and Bishop Hammond's church in Fort Washington out that way. And that was his number one thing about the people. If you can do this, I applaud you, but it's going to take a miracle of God to get this off the ground because matters are going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about it is this, this has been going on for the video that we watched last week. Uh, says that it's been going on for 30 years. Well, that video was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's been going on for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. It's just now beginning to take hold. Mm -hmm. The Seven Mountains movement is starting to take hold. And people are like Lance, um, Lance Wall 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 whatever the name is. Wall Wall yes, he is one of the major things, but there are a lot of other major guys talking about it also. And they're coming up with a strategy and that strategy, which we will get into before we get to the end of this study, as long as y'all want to keep moving on with it. And, uh, but let me point out this one thing which I did not point out before, which is at the top of your screen up there. The media and entertainment have done more to shape the culture than the church. But the church has TV shows, they have books, and yeah. we're the only ones watching ourselves and reading to each other. This is why we have a problem talking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The number one movie of last year, the year before, whatever it was, was The Passion of Christ. Mm -hmm. That movie made over $500 million. Mm -hmm. But who watched it? Christians. Mostly Christians. Christians. Okay. Anybody else got anything they'd like to say? All right. Since nobody's speaking up. We need another Francis Swagger. Francis Swagger? Years ago, when uh, she and her husband were at the top of their game, they gave her permission to do a uh, series once a, a month. And she was very popular among the women's groups to, to be their, their speaker. And, and every conference where she went,